Earlier in the service, or just before uh, the announcements uh, leading up to this uh, time uh, took place, uh, we heard the King is coming, and I really want us to, uh, to look at that thought today. Uh, the idea is how to live in the light of His coming. It's not a message on the second coming, but the fact of His coming. And in Luke chapter 12, when Jesus talks about that, it is not in the speculative sense where we formulate certain plans or certain chronologies and that kind of thing. It's just the fact that He's going to come again and how we are to live in the light of that. That uh, Earlier in that chapter, He talks about the... Uh, uh, we don't need to worry about certain things that we add to our lives, uh, what we're to eat, what we're to wear, that kind of thing. And then he ends the first part of that chapter by saying that where our treasure is, our heart will be there also. And then immediately he goes into this parable, or it's an expanded parable, and then some exhortations that he gives to us regarding how to live in the light of the coming of the Lord. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart is going to be. And so he talks to us about that. I'm going to point out a number of things, four in particular, things that we're going to see that the Lord highlights here. But uh, while you have turned there, let me just remind us of another occasion. Uh, back in the Old Testament, there's an interesting story that is given. It only, I think it's about five or six or seven verses in length. You can read through that in probably 30 seconds of time. And it's the time in Numbers chapter 20 where God says to Moses, I want you to take Aaron and his son Eliezer up Mount Hor, and I want you to remove the priestly garments from Aaron, place them on Eliezer, because they're on the mountain uh, Aaron is going to be gathered to his people. He's going to die there. Those few verses of Scripture will give us the outline of that, or give us the story of that, how they go up the mountain, how this all takes place, and Aaron dies. And if you are like many of us, you read through that text, and you just keep on going, okay, so it's a nice story. This is how Aaron died, and now what's going to happen next? And sometimes we don't pause to remember that these are very ordinary people that were dealing with some very extraordinary uh, assignments by the Lord, but they're just very ordinary people. They have the same kinds of emotions, same kinds of problems, same kinds of uh, challenges, same kinds of doubts that you and I do. And, and I've stopped recently when I've read through that text and I've just asked some questions about this whole event. Now the Bible doesn't give us the, in, the answer to this, so you can kind of fill in some of the things if you'd like to. But, but as I've read through that, I've asked uh, my own heart, I wonder how Moses told Aaron. I wonder what Aaron's response was. What was the expression on his face? I wonder what kind of thoughts may have gone through the mind of Aaron when Moses says, Aaron, today we're going to climb the mountain. You're going to die there. God has said, this is the day you're going to die. I've wondered if Aaron said to Moses, wait just a few minutes. I need to go see somebody that uh, there's a problem we've had and I need to be sure that that's settled. I wonder if these men fell on each other's necks and they wept a bit. I wonder what they talked about when they began to climb the mountain. I wonder if, uh, if Moses and Aaron may have uh, just relived or may have talked about the, the days of boyhood that they lost because Moses was being uh, trained in growing up in the house of uh, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt while he, Aaron, was being brought up in the house of a Hebrew slave. I wonder if perhaps Aaron may have apologized to Moses for the problems he created. He created a few of them. I remember the golden calf event. I remember the time when, uh, when Aaron and his sister Miriam presumed to have some of the honor that was going to Moses because, after all, they were of equal status, they thought, and God brought some disciplines to them. I, I wonder if, I wonder what happened and how this all played out. Let your mind kind of go as well at this moment. It's a sanctified mind at this point, and so let your sanctified mind just envision, how did this event actually play out? What did Moses actually do as he took the garments that were there on, the priestly garments that were on Aaron, and place them on Eliezer. And, and I wonder, if, I, I wonder if, uh, if uh, Aaron said, should I lie down now and die or prop up on a tree or sit down on a rock or just stand here and keel over? What, have you ever wondered about some of those things? <laughs> These are very ordinary people facing life and now death event in the course of their journey. Well, the point of the story is Aaron knew 
that today I'm going to die. God has told me today. Now, Moses would be told, later on uh, Elijah would be told, but folks, most of us, uh, that's just the very few people in the Bible that uh, maybe, perhaps there's some others I don't recall, but those are the three that I remember at the moment that were told today is the day you're going to die. If, if you knew that today was the day that Jesus was going to come himself or come for you by way of death, would you need to say, time out just for a moment. There are some things that I need to do. And so what Jesus is doing in this text is simply this. He's, he's telling these disciples and, and us as the followers of Christ as the years pass by, that, I, that we are to live every day with that awareness that this may be the day. When I get up in the morning and I do whatever I do to get ready for the day, this may be the day. And what do I need to do? Are there any things I need to correct, fulfill, finalize? I need to live today with very short accounts before God. Now, Jesus is going to outline some things, and I'm going to give you four of them today. And uh, there, there is, first of all, the parable that begins at verse 35, and then I think it's at verse 41, is the expansion of that that's going to come as a result of a question from Peter. And then later on, there are two other paragraphs that Jesus is going to attach to this. And the first thing that you're going to see is this. In verse 35, it says, Be dressed in readiness, and keep your lamps al alight, and be like men who are waiting for the master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself and serve them and have them recline at table and will come up and wait on them. Later verse 40, you to be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. And so the first thing here is to be ready. That's what he says, be ready. Be dressed in readiness or let your loins be girded in readiness. Literally is what is uh, the text that says here. Now, the idea is this. There are two commands or two exhortations that are here. First of all, is to be ready. And, and so simply to be dressed in readiness. That's what it's all about. Now, they understood in the culture of the day, these long robes that even the men wore there, that when they needed to make some rapid progress, they would reach down, take the tail of that uh, robe and stick it into the sash of the belt so that they would not be hindered in their activity of movement and doing whatever it was they were supposed to do. But literally, it means just be dressed for readiness. Now, yesterday we attended the happy celebration, the graduation of, of our granddaughter, uh, Sarah, and before we got there, I had called Sean and I said, what is the appropriate dress for the occasion? And so he told me how the, uh, they were told to be dressed for the occasion, so we came in pro proper attire. Now, this is the way I go to church on Sunday. How you go to church on Sunday is up to you, but this is the way I go to church for me. For me, this is the appropriate dress for Sunday morning, if I'm going to be preaching or not. And so, you know, that's just, I'm, I was born in another era, and so that's okay. Uh, and so, uh, now last week, when my wife and I were planting some flowers in the flower bed and digging up some uh, uh, some old grass uh, roots that were there and, and then I had to mow the grass and then there were some things I needed to paint. I had on different kinds of garments because I was dressed for the occasion. I wasn't dressed for Sunday morning service. I was dressed for uh, Thursday morning doing the weeding and planting of flowers and all those good things. I, I was thinking the other day about the occasion not so long ago of the Super Bowl, and here are these two uh, super teams, supposedly, and they're now facing each other, and they've been preparing for this, and, and here are these two high-powered quarterbacks and, and very intense coaches that are there, and, and I just tried to envision the occasion where now they have come through all of the preseason and the season and the playoffs, and now they have finally gotten to the place where they're going to face each other for the, for the battle, for the championship, the Super Bowl championship, and I can just envision Bilicek or uh, Carroll saying to their quarterback, uh, Brady or Wilson, go in, it's time for you to run this play, and them to say, wait a minute, coach, I'm, I'm dressed in street clothes. That's a stupid thought to even let that pass through your mind because these men, since the last game of last year, have been envisioning and dreaming and fantasizing about this very moment. 
And since the last playoff game, the two weeks between that and this time, they have spent literally hours upon hours upon hours reviewing film and going over plays and all of this kind of thing. They have dreamed of it. They have done all of this in their, in their minds, in their, in their beds, wherever they've been, as they've slept, as they've been about the way. They have envisioned how this defensive alignment with these particular uh, men over there and how our offensive team over here with our personnel, what play can we run in order that we may be successful? It's an absolutely stupid thought to think they had to go get dressed for the occasion. They have been dressed for hours by the time the game begins. And they're waiting for the moment when the coach says, go in. They all have it played out in their minds already. They're dressed for the occasion. Jesus says, be dressed for the occasion. Anything that will get in your way Get it removed from your life. Those things that will trip you up, those things that are going to get in the way so that you cannot make progress. The implications here are we can get our eyes onto the things around us. Our ears can listen to the things that will detract us. Our our minds can be, uh, you know, in other places. And so we need to be focused so that we have everything in readiness so that when Jesus comes, we don't need any time to get ready because we are ready. And so the first part of this admonition in the be ready part is that we are to, uh, we're to have our, our clothing on and the proper, uh, uh, proper attire for the moment. And so we're to be dressed in readiness. Second part of it, he says, let your, your lamps be alight. Now, uh, I, again, the culture of the day had a, perhaps an understanding beyond what you and I do, but I think we get the idea that, that we are to, uh, we're to have the lights on. I like what the, the message says here, the paraphrase from Eugene Peterson He says, uh, have the welcome mat out. When the lights are on and the welcome mat is out, we're saying to the the, uh, visitors, to the guests that are coming, we're expecting you, we're ready for you, we want you to be here. Years ago, I think Sean was probably just a very little guy at this point in time, uh, we moved into a new community in the church that we served, and uh, uh, the church had uh, bought another house, and we were going to be moving into that house. And not long after we moved in, it was Halloween, and, and some of our neighbors said, now, you need to be ready, because we have a lot of kids that come on Halloween for trick-or-treat. And so when my wife went to the, to the grocery store or to the whatever store it was, she added a few more items to the list that she already would have gotten. And, and so we were all ready for the trick-or-treaters to come. Now, now, what we didn't know was that they didn't just bring them in. They brought them in by bus loads. They literally brought them in by the buses and vans that were filled with kids. Obviously, this was a community that was safe and apparently liberal in their giving. And so we thought that we were ready. Now, it didn't take but about 30, 45 minutes of knocks on the doors until we began to pare back. We didn't give three pieces of candy. We started giving one piece of candy. And then I think we started breaking them in two, you know. And that ran out before long. And so what do you do? You close the door. You turn off the light. You go to the back of the house. And you're sending the signal, you are not welcome here. We're not participating. We're not home. Don't knock on the door. When Jesus says, let your lamps be alight, the welcome mat is on, uh, is out, the light is on, and we're looking out the door at every noise that we hear, anticipating the guests to arrive. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, be dressed in readiness. That all of the clutter of life is to be moved aside. Those things that will get in the way of your progress. The light is to be on. The welcome mat is out. And you're saying to the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I am ready to meet you today. As far as I know in my life, there isn't anything that needs to be dealt with because I am living dressed in readiness. And the light is on. You're welcome. I've discovered something, I didn't know this before, you may have already known this, but I've discovered through our daughter that at Krispy Kreme Donut Place, when the donuts are hot, there's a light they turn on. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Now, not only did, is the light on, but they also have this program where if you buy one dozen donuts, you get another dozen free. 
Guess where my daughter always wants to go when I take her over to the town where there's a Krispy Kreme donut. Let's go see if the light is on. <laughs> now, not only that, but I, I just go ahead and ask, uh, you know, my wife, you want to go see if the light's on? <laughs> and she said, of course. So now, as you can tell, we go by and we stop regularly because the light is on. What are they, they, it's, not, it's not just welcome. They're saying, come on. Come on, we've got what you want. Now, folks, when we're ready for the Lord to come, the light is on. And, and we're saying, come on. Come on. I, I'm ready to live today, but I'm ready to meet you today. That's what Jesus is emphasizing in this text. You don't know the hour when I'm coming, so just be on watch and be ready. Now, the second thing that Jesus is going to say to them is to be responsible. And with that, it's going to come in response to a question that is going to be asked by Peter. And Peter says to the Lord at the end of this parable, uh, at the beginning of the next paragraph in the text, he says, Lord, uh, uh, Jesus, Lord, are, are you giving this parable for us, the followers, the disciples, or is it for everybody? And so notice how Jesus is going to respond to this in verse 42. He said, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds doing so when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. And then he goes on to talk about some other things here about not being so faithful in this. But the idea is this. I'm giving an assignment to you, now just be responsible and do what you are supposed to do. I'm placing something in your hands, there is a responsibility, there is a, a, a gift or an assignment that I'm giving, and now out of that you are to be faithful and you are to be what, uh, responsible to do what you're supposed to do. Now, you and I have been given assignments, haven't we? There isn't a one of us in this room as a follower of Christ, but what we have been given a gift or gifts by the Holy Spirit. Now, not only is the Holy Spirit himself a gift that resides within us, but that the Bible says he gives to us as he wills gifts that we are to now utilize in some way. You can read the various lists that are in the New Testament of the gifts of the Spirit. And what you discover is that, that the gifts of the Spirit are not so that we can say to one another, I have a gift or gifts of the Spirit, and I put them on display in the, in the uh, trophy room so that we can dust them off and just go and observe them from time to time. That's not the idea at all. We come to the text in Ephesians chapter 4, and he says that, that he gives to some that gift of the prophet and the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the, uh, the pastors or the preachers and the teachers. Why? For the work of ministry, for the perfecting of the saints, to the building up or the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come to that full stature of maturity in the Lord. And so what he has done is he has given to us gifts and those gifts are to be now employed in the service of the Lord and God has placed you in the body of Christ that you call First Alliance Church and it isn't just so that you can say I have a gift and my gift is discernment or my gift is liberality or my gift is preaching or teaching or my gift is whatever other gift it may be just so that you can say that, but you put that into practice so that the body of Christ is functioning like it's supposed to function. And when that is happening, there's life that is here. And this life is going to be reproductive because there's going to be new life in Christ as a result of that. So God has given to us gifts. There's something else that God says to us, and it is that the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. That means he doesn't take them back. When he gives to you a gift, it is a gift. A gift is just that. You don't take it back. My wife and I are enjoying a very, a very lovely gift right now. Uh, we have some friends that uh, are over in one of our churches uh, between here and, and Charlotte, and uh, uh, they said to us on a number of occasions, we have a, a, a lake cottage, and we want you to stay there sometime. We just, we just come. It's free. Just come. And we have never done that before. And, and some of you may know that Stephen... Uh, uh, our grandson uh, has been living with us or staying with us for the past two weeks between the time of the college uh, being fi finalized there at TFC and, 
and, uh, and then him going on this missions trip. And, and so, uh, uh, as some of you also know, the car that he had uh, went the way of many other cars. It's in happy car world, wherever that is. Uh, perhaps been crushed by this time, I don't know. But, but uh, so uh, he didn't have transportation. So guess who was his transportation to the airport? That was granddad and grandmama. And that was in Charlotte. So, you know, Thursday, Stephen is to be at the airport. Sunday, we are, Saturday, we're to be here for the graduation. Nobody is home over there, so what are we going to do? We don't go back just to drive back up the next day. Uh, it's uh, three hours back on the other side of Charlotte where we live. So we said, why not call our friends who said we have a lake cottage? And folks, we have just been suffering over this lake cottage. Uh, we have, we've sat out, we've uh, watched the cranes, we've watched all the other things going on. We've just sat there and just enjoyed. It's a gift. They said, it won't cost you anything. There's even some food there if you want it, and there are some soft drinks there if you want. Just come. It's a gift. I can't give it back. They've just bestowed a gift on us. God says that the gifts of God, He doesn't take back now. The fact is, however, that as we process through life, there are those times when the exercise or the expressing of those gifts may change. Let me illustrate it. Through all of it, God is saying, just be faithful and be sensible, use wisdom. God called me into ministry a lot of years ago, and after I'd fought with God about this for a while, He won, obviously, and, and I said, okay, Lord, and so then you go off to prepare for college, in college and, and, and get ready for ministry, and, and, uh, and, and then uh, I, if there was ever a green preacher or pastor, I was the greenest of the green. And while still in college, I said to my wife, by this time we're married, for me to call her what my wife, I said to my wife, uh, you know, we need to find some place to get some experience because, you know, in a couple of years, we're going to be out of here. And, 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 and I don't know a thing about pastoring a church. Uh, you grew up in a pastor's home, but I didn't. And uh, so we found a very loving and gracious and kind and considerate and generous pastor that would put up with us. And for the next couple of years, we were there. And, and the day that we graduated, got our diploma, we walked across the stage, got our diploma, got in our car. Behind it was a U-Haul trailer with everything that we owned. And the next Sunday, I was the pastor of a church. I didn't have a senior pastor to rely on. And all the time, God just says, be faithful. And uh, I, I thought, I said, you know, how do you begin a ministry? I know what we need to do. We need to, have we need to have communion, communion service. Now, in my mind, folks, I had envisioned a communion service that would make heaven and earth envious. <laughs> it really would. Uh, in my mind, I was going, we had all this beautiful, wonderful music that was going to take place. I was going to preach this, this magnificent sermon. And then we were going to have communion. And I figured in my mind, it's going to take about an hour and 15 to an hour and 30 minutes. But I think that's going to be okay. It's my first Sunday at this church and they'll let me get by with this. Well, the service began. So, you know, by 1230, we'll be over. At 1230, we were home and almost finished with lunch. <laughs> I mean, it just, and I discovered I've got to prepare two sermons. In those days, it was a full Sunday morning, Sunday night service and a Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time. And so I've got to prepare two full sermons a week and a Bible study uh, a week. And, and I've got to learn how to lead this church. And I started crying, God, I don't know what to do. And God just says, be faithful. The gifts and callings of God, I'm not going to take back. Just be faithful. I'll be God here. Now, I can also tell you that in those early days, I loved, I absolutely loved Monday through Saturday. Sunday was a nightmare for me. It scared me to death. And God just kept saying, be faithful, my gift, my calling, I'm not going to take back. Now in time, in time, I got to the place where Sunday, I longed for Sunday. I could tell people what God said. And God was working with those gifts that he had given to bring them to maturity. For 35 years, I learned what it meant to pastor a church. After 35 years of pastoring, you kind of think you have it down. You kind of know what to do. If you don't, you're probably never going to learn. 
And then God says, I have a new assignment for you. And uh, I thought, but God, I kind of know how to do this. He said, I have something for you that you don't know how to do. But the gifts and callings of God, I don't take back. Just be faithful. And so now for almost 12 years, I've become a district superintendent. And I say, God, I don't know how to do this. And he said, I know that. But I know how to do this. My gifts, my callings are irrevocable. I don't take them back. Just be faithful. I'll take care of the rest. And then we come to the end of that. At the end of that time, I'm too old for a church to want me. As a pastor, I'm too uh, tired to take one anyway. And so I said, God, what are we going to do? He says, I've got that figured out too. I'm going to give you some preaching assignments, but now, but now I'm going to make you a caregiver. And I said, God, first of all, I don't know how to do that. And secondly, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm not a caregiver. He said, you're about to become one. <laughs> now, I've discovered something. All those gifts that God gives, they are transferable gifts regardless of where you are in life ministry, in life function, in life pursuit. The gifts and callings that God gives to you are not just for this little period of time, the expression of them may take place differently down there. And God has assigned to us in these latter days the most difficult of all of those assignments, as far as I am concerned, it's giving care to, first of all, a mother-in-law, my wife's mother, that was aging and was nearing death, and my father as well, and our daughter that needs care. But you know what? We discovered some time ago that God had given to us the greatest of privileges. That in addition to the preaching assignments that he has given to us in these years, that we had the privilege of seeing how to die. How a saint of God should die. Both in mom and then in dad. What is God saying? I'm giving to you a responsibility and I'm giving to you the gifts that that responsibility may be fulfilled. And just be faithful. Be responsible. Other things that he has to say in the text that we don't have the time to, to look at very carefully here. So uh, just uh, take the assignment, uh, fulfill the assignment, apply the task that the God, the God has given you. Apply to that task the gifts and the callings of God. And let God be God. And one day he will say, well done. Well done. There's a third thing here, and I've taken more time with these first two than intentionally than I planned to with these latter two, and so all the people can say amen if you want to, but we're going to finalize this quickly. The next thing that he says is this, be realistic. It's interesting that following that expanded part of the parable, when you come to verse 49, he says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish that it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. And then he describes that division in part. I, I think sometimes we as a part of the family of God can have blinders on and somehow think that all we have to do is come to Jesus and everything is going to be smooth sailing. And he says, that's not the way it is. I am the dividing line. I'm the line in the sand. And when you come to follow me, you become a Christ follower. I have peace for you, but not peace between you and a world system that's out there. But I have peace for you. Folks, we're never going to have peace in this world until Jesus, the King of Peace, comes, about which we heard in song a moment ago. Not until the Prince of Peace is here ruling and reigning as the Prince and King of Peace, there will not be peace on this earth. We can have symposiums and conferences and seminars and summits and leagues of nations and united nations and they're never really united and we are never, never, never going to have peace on this earth. Momentary lulls in the battle perhaps, but not peace. The Jew and the Arab will never have peace. It's just written. They will never have peace. A ceasefire temporarily, and sometimes that is already broken before the ink is dry on the paper. 
Why? Because the hostility that is in the human heart is there, and in a God-denying, Christ-denying, Bible-hating world, we are not going to have peace. And in this country in which you and I live and love, if we think that it's going to be, become increasingly popular to be a Christ follower, we are deceiving ourselves. Jesus says, be realistic. If you're following me, there is going to be controversy and conflict and problem by a world system that is out there. You will not have peace there, but you will have peace with God. And if we think that terrorism began at 9-11, it did not. It began the day when that man, Cain, said to his brother Abel, let's take a walk. And before the day was over, he had murdered his brother and terrorism began and it will be, get greater and greater. We name it differently perhaps in this day. What is Jesus saying? When you follow me, I have peace within for you, but there's trouble out there and we're rapidly, rapidly hastening toward the consummation of history. He just says, don't be naive, be realistic. It isn't going to get better it's going to get worse. But in following Jesus, there's going to be peace within, and he's going to give you everything that you need in the troubled times ahead. The fourth thing that he now is going to point out is this closing paragraph. Verse 54, he says, uh, uh, he also was saying to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so, and so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it's going to be hot today and it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And he goes on to give us additional uh, exhortations and information here. Now, be reasonable. Be rational. Be able to interpret the signs that are around you. Remember there was that day when some came to him and showed us a sign and Jesus says the sign has already been given, the sign of the prophet Jonah. As he was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he says that, uh, that Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, not at the great fish story by Jonah, but at the preaching of Jonah. He preached with an anointing, with a power. He may not have been a very cooperative servant of God, and we would all, don't want to emulate his, uh, his uh, life in, in many different ways. But when he preached to Nineveh, Nineveh repented. Jesus says, greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the south came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And a greater than Solomon is here. You need to be able to analyze and to understand the times. I am here is what he's saying to them. You need to look at me. I am the son of God. I am the, the, I am the fulfillment of the type that Jonah was in the, in the great fish story that is there. And all of the other things that are taking place, you need to understand. I am the resolve. I am the answer that be reasonable. Analyze the times. Know where you are. And don't become so uh, uh, taken up in the things that are going on around you that you lose your prophetic sense or balance. We can become so speculative we are no value or so ignorant that we're of no value, spiritually speaking. He says, just be not only realistic, but be reasonable, reasonable or rational. Look at what's going on around you. All of this is saying we're marching to the consummation of history and the new heavens and the new earth just about to break upon us. Just be ready, is what he's saying. When I take these four statements that we have before us and I try to reduce them down to just a statement or two and I look at what is the result of all of this. Jesus says, be ready. Have the, your loins girded in readiness and have the lamps alight, your lamps alight. There will be a recognition by the master. He will serve at the table as you will participate and I will participate in the feast of the bridegroom. And he says not only that, but there will be that exaltation because we will share the banquet. Imagine that. Here is the king serving the servant. But that's the picture. And so there's recognition and then there's exaltation. We come to that next one on be responsible. And there's reassignment. And expansion, he says in later in that text that we did not read, that, that if you're faithful over the little, I'll make you master or ruler over the much. Be faithful. If you're not, 
then there's going to be some judgments going to take place regarding that as well. And so now there's this expansion, greater assignment. And what about that realistic part here? To just be realistic that, that you're not going to live in, in, in easy times, it's trouble times. What is result? It's rest. He gives us rest in the midst of all of that, and we're energized. He talks about the, the, the fire that is burning that, that sometimes is not just the, uh, uh, what we may envision here, but it's also that passion that he places within our very souls. And the flame and fire of God that burns within keeps you energized. Then be reasonable. Well, when that's taking place, there's going to be a responsiveness and an embracing. He says, settle the issues along the way so there's nothing left to do. And so you're going to be included. You're going to be increased. You're going to be infilled. And you're going to be insightful. It's amazing, isn't it? Be ready. Be responsive. Be realistic. Be reasonable. The king is coming. We're hastening, marching, headlong, running toward the consummation of history. And it's not going to be very long until the clouds will roll back and the voice will sound and the trumpet will will blast and the dead in Christ will rise and for those that are looking for him instantly caught up to be with the Lord forever now the question if you knew that this was the day what would you need to do? Do it now. Father, as we are before you, we're thankful that you give to us warnings. You give to us insights. You give to us instructions. You give to us enablings. You give to us everything that we need in order that we may be not only ready, but responsible, realistic, and reasonable. Be glorified in our midst. And if there is one here that needs to deal with some issues so that they would not be caught unaware, may this be that moment. Thank you for that amazing grace of God where you've reached to people like us, like me, and the mercy of God that is reached to us. And we pray that you might be glorified in us. And we thank you. As we wait just a moment, perhaps in your own heart, you need to cry out to God. If you do, would you just take care of that even now? Whatever is going on, whatever God is placing before you, would you just tell him about it? He already knows it, but just tell him about it. And commit to him whatever he is asking of you and receive from him what he is offering. And everyone said, Amen.